Welcome, everybody. My name is Franklin Odo. I'm moderating uh, tonight's uh, discussion with our author, Gail Okawa, um, who wrote this very interesting book called Remembering Our Godfather's, Grandfather's Exile. And we have her um, <coughs> on the show this evening, and we'll run for close to an hour, I think. Um, so it's a pleasure to welcome you, Gail. Um, uh, good evening in, in, on the East Coast and good afternoon in Hawaii. Uh, Greetings from the, West, from the Rust Belt. <laughs> yes, you're from the Rust Belt. Are you, are you calling in from Hawaii? Are you Ohio? Yes. Yes, okay, yes. good. Well, we, I think we have a, a, a nice audience um, this afternoon. So hopefully we'll um, have an entertaining uh, session for, for everyone. So tell me um, first, uh, how you got started on this project? It was it was such an interesting read. Well, thank you. But let me um, first. I'd like to um, thank Roger and his uh, Hawaii Book and Music Festival staff. Also, uh, Craig Howes and his folks, um, uh, UH Press, uh, the Japanese Cultural Center of Hawaii volunteers and translators. Uh, Franklin and your staff many years ago at the Smithsonian, um, and really all the families, uh, friends and relatives who have been supporting me on this project for 18 years. Um, it's, it's a real commu community effort, so I wanted to thank everyone for their support. Okay, so this was the um, historical marker that was established after a great deal of controversy. Um, that's another story. Um, but I, I actually found that um, it was a life-changing experience for me to go to this dedication. Um, first, I'd like to just read the wording on the marker because that was one thing that really struck me. This is um, right if, I don't know if you can see it, but it's basically the wording right here on the plaque. It says, at this site, due east and below the hill, 4,555 men of Japanese ancestry were incarcerated in a Department of Justice internment camp from March 1942 to April 1940, 1946. Most were excluded by law from becoming United States citizens and were removed primarily from the West Coast and Hawaii. During World War II, their loyalty to the United States was questioned. Many of the men held here without due process were longtime resident, resi religious leaders, businessmen, teachers, fishermen, farmers, and others. No person of Japanese ancestry in the US was ever charged or convicted of espionage throughout the course of the war. Many of the internees had relatives who served with distinction in the American armed forces in Europe and in the Pacific. This marker is placed here as a reminder that history is a valuable teacher only if we do not forget our past. So with this and the event that, that accompanied it, the dedication and the, um, uh, the luncheon that followed, I saw that there were hundreds of internees and this really helped me realize the importance of the research to real families uh, in our community. So this was not simply an academic project as I understood it from this experience. Wow, excellent. That, that, that plaque, the reading, the, the um, writing on the plaque is uh, a good summary of what happened. So about 120,000 persons of Japanese ancestry were incarcerated during World War II from um, Hawaii and, and the continent. Um, but mass incarceration, the mass removal uh, of um, Japanese Americans did not take place in Hawaii. So your grandfather was one of what about a thousand individuals who were picked up by the FBI, uh, uh, I, and the months yeah, after I, Pearl Harbor. 
I think there were, um, yes, a, a few thousand, but uh, the men from Hawaii who were sent in 10 uh, transfer boats were numbered about 700. So- uh, what, what, was, what was his name, by the way? We should have his name. Oh, Reverend Thomas Akugo Atanabe. Okay. I also learned that uh, he, you know, through his letters that he felt that kind of confidence. And um, he continued his ministry, um, officiating at, at services. I found that I was, I was actually uh, not surprised at his faith, the, the fact that he, he um, continued to uh, practice, but he continued also to have faith in um, American democracy, despite the fact that he was um, imprisoned in the way he was. This, this also was very interesting to me um, because it showed, this is a no uh, libretto for a no play. Um, this is something that a number of, of uh, Issei in the camps uh, seem to have a lot of pleasure with. They, they continued to, uh, some of them actually um, belonged to chanting societies before the war. And they continued this practice. But one of the things that I found so interesting was that they, um, I think they must have gotten original copies and then passed these around um, because these were written in the individual's hand. Uh, so, so this was actually copied from some other uh, libretto by my grandfather. And uh, I also found that Reverend Fujitani, uh, Kodo Fujitani had a whole collection of um, uh, librettos that he, uh, that he had also copied. So these men would, would sit in um, these chanting societies and they would, you know, they would um, chant together. But the, <clears throat> what was so interesting to me is that in the, I believe it was in the 1970s, uh, the late 60s and early 70s, I had not known anything about my grandfather's interest in no or his practice um, of, uh, of, the, of no chanting, but I had gotten interested in no uh, through a class that I took at, at the uh, UH. And I ended up going to Japan um, to actually learn <laughs> some dance and, and some chanting myself. Uh, or some song myself. And um, I, this was one of those real missed opportunities. You know, I didn't know until after he died that we had this, this common interest. So that was a, one of the sad, but, but um, interesting facts for me. You know, I, I remember having had to, in graduate school, <clears throat> um, reading some of the no plays, which were not easy to read. Uh, this, these were written, um, the original no plays, 13th, 14th, 15th centuries? Right. Um, from the, I mean, classical texts. Very, very classical, yes. So the fact that yeah. these men, um, you know, first of all, that they could read them and that they enjoyed chanting together, I thought was a real interest, a real um, kind of symbolic um, action on their part that this was a real, you know, it was a chorus. They would yeah. chant together and they would be able to, um, uh, they would be one basically, you know, and, and because I had actually uh, studied some of this, both uh, myself by learning how to do this very, very basic uh, kind of chanting, um, and because I'd watched films of it and watched the actual plays, um, I could hear the, the men in the East Day in the camps in a way, yeah. you know, and how they would sound together as one voice. So I thought that was really symbolic um, as, a, as a means of um, surviving, really. Yeah. You know, not only their, not only their, um, were they, 
doing something that was familiar to them, but they were doing something together and that was unifying in, in itself. Um, oh, I, and I did find out this, that this was Barrack 64 at the Santa Fe internment camp. But I didn't, I, I will never know um, really how he had changed. This is, this is one of my regrets. I will never know how he really changed. And I'm sorry, I, I got a little distracted here. So um, th these are the five record, record groups or the f four record groups but the five files that I found. And um, what, was, what was fortunate in, in this, sorry, was that um, I found all of these files of the of these um, Issei men, and I decided to move from a single the single biography to a collective biography. But then I had to find the families um, in Hawaii, which was another story, of course, and that that was a slow process. But fortunately, um, the JCCH, the Japanese Cultural Center of Hawaii staff, was organizing parallel research. They had been uh, working on the beginnings of the Honolulu Uli research, I believe. And um, uh, they had events, one of them called the Dark Clouds Over uh, Paradise. It was a series of, of different um, uh, talks and so on. And because of that, they were raising attention to questions of justice in in terms of this, this particular part of the incarceration. Um, and then 55 years later, of course, um, it was hard to find people. Uh, it, it wasn't like, you know, they were just available uh, easily, but um, thanks to others, I was able to talk to a few Issei. Um, the Nisei were for, forthcoming, some were very forthcoming were very forthcoming, more than willing, uh, and gave me many materials. Um, so that the, there's really referrals. Um, at, and I, I gave a number of talks and each, at each event um, when I shared what I had learned uh, in Honolulu or the Big Island or Maui, there were very often interning families in the audience and um, some would or more than one person might come forward uh, to talk with me. So it was a really, you know, um, it evolved as a community uh, research project in many ways. And, and I did wanna at least um, share with you uh, four, four people to begin with. Uh, as I said, there were many, many moving stories. I talked to over 40, family members, internees and family members. Um, but the four internees themselves, um, this is Reverend Shingetsu Akahoshi, who was in his 80, 90s when I met him in Virginia. Uh, he was a Buddhist minister and an artist whom I actually um, had a time to, to talk with um, in, a, in an interview. Um, and I, I learned that he actually remembered my grandfather. He was the only, actually of all the Issei that I talked to, I didn't talk to that many Issei, but I mean, of the Issei I talked to, he was the only one who had personal, a personal rec rec uh, recollection of my grandfather, which I do relate in the book. But he was an artist and, and um, did Western style paintings as, as you can see here, um, but he also did Japanese style paintings. And um, in this case, he uh, did the painting when, while uh, Reverend uh, Fujitani uh, did the calligraphy. So this was probably yeah. from uh, the Santa Fe internment camp. Yeah, what, what happened to the paintings? Well, um, this painting is in the possession of the Fujitani family. And I believe 
uh, these two paintings are in the possession of uh, Akoshi Sensei's family. So the, another, another uh, Issei who was very helpful to me was Reverend Matsuura. Um, he was also in his 90s, uh, was a Buddhist minister, uh, eventually became the Bishop of Soto Mission in Honolulu. Um, and remember that the government, the US government considered clergy to be security risks. Uh, high security risks. Uh, and so they rounded them all up, the, the Buddhists and the um, Shinto priests especially, but there were others as well. Um, but, but the interesting thing about uh, Reverend Matsuura, now you can see him here, is that he had a wife and baby, a very, a, a very young baby, and his censored letters to his wife revealed the real pain of family separation, what is called today, we call family separation. But I think his letters, more than many other letters, revealed that pain uh, and that, that anxiety, the constant anxiety of being separated from family. I found a number of letters uh, from different families that, that reflected that. You know, can you say something about wh why, why, why did officials censor these letters? I mean, these guys were in prison. They weren't anywhere near um, defense installations. They, could, they, they constituted no threat. What, what was going on? Well, um, apparently, uh, they had a list of things that you weren't supposed, they were not supposed to write about or make allusion to and so on. So, um, it, it, you know, if they crossed certain lines, I guess um, the censors would cut out and you can see that they, you know, they either cut out lines as, as in the case of this letter here or whole paragraphs in the case of this letter. And, and that was the, the other thing about the letter writing is that to begin with, they were only allowed to write in English, which was very hard for the Issei wow. because there were those who uh, really uh, could not write in English. They did, some of them took classes, you know, so that they started to learn English, but um, basically that was not comfortable for them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, these, the anguish that they were feeling they couldn't express in this foreign language. Um, so it was very difficult for them. I think this was one of the um, greatest causes of anxiety was being able to communicate with their families uh, through somebody else. And uh, then he, eventually, because the Geneva Convention, I believe um, said that you should be able to write, you know, communicate in your own language. Um, so it was after a, a certain amount of time that the government then allowed the Issei to uh, write in Japanese. And uh, yet, if they went, you know, if they wrote about the wrong, wrong things, then they got the, you know, this whole section, the whole paragraph cut out. But um, Reverend Matsuura had hundreds of letters. I mean, I, the family had kept letters between him and his and his wife uh, and there were there were really the boxes you know <laughs> there's a whole box wow. of letters um, but I was also very honored to have his painting um, of the Santa Fe camp on the cover of my book so I was very happy that uh, the family allowed me to uh, wow. to use that so this was a, an interesting painting because um, I actually found the same uh, outline in another set of colors from another family. Um, so my, I, this is why I use the term rendered, that it was the, because I think it may have there, there may have been an art class of some sort where um, different internees sort of interpreted, you know, the, the uh, scene in terms of their own experience. But anyway, um, 
Reverend Matsuda's painting I thought was really lovely and, and um, pictured in many ways, it pictured the isolation of the camp itself. Um, now, Reverend Ohara, Kenjo Ohara, um, was one of the youngest Buddhist ministers who was picked up. He was actually maybe the most recent arrival to the islands at the time. Um, and he wasn't on the FBI list. So he tells the story of um, the FBI coming for his, the um, senior monk, I mean, excuse me, the senior uh, priest and, um, and asking who he was. And Reverend Ohara gave him his name. And so the guy writes his name down. And then a few days later, they came to pick him up. Um, so he, <laughs> he could, if he hadn't been so honest, I suppose he may have um, escaped that. Um, but he was, uh, he tells an interesting story of being interrogated. Uh, and the interrogator constantly asking him if he's a spy. And he says, no, no, I'm not a spy. And um, he gave the same answer over and over and over again. So that apparently someone um, who was transporting him or something said, why don't you just say you're a spy? And he says, <laughs> no, I'm not a spy. Well, you know, someone like me would never be a spy. You know, th there's no relationship between the two jobs. <laughs> and, uh, and he says, and why would they want someone like me who doesn't even speak English to be a spy? <laughs> so, you know, he, he was uh, really quite an interesting uh, character. But, but he, uh, as the, a minister, um, also, uh, you know, was respected and treated with respect. Uh, here he is with uh, Reverend uh, Kuchiba, who eventually also became a, a bishop. But he also was very creative with his hands um, and told me that he had learned this craft of plating uh, in Hiroshima when he was a child. But when he was at Camp Livingston, Louisiana, the, which was a, an a very different um, environment, right, from, from the, the desert. Um, they had longleaf pine needles uh, or pine trees, excuse me, they had longleaf pine trees there. And so he would collect uh, the pine needles and somehow, mm -hmm. I don't know how, uh, flatten them and braid them into these kinds of um, strips and then stitch them into these purses. Wow. So these are stitched, not woven, stitched. And this really is the size of a small briefcase, this one here. Um, so I, I just found it in, uh, extraordinary that they would be able to do these kinds of things, these laborious you know, tasks, but, but it gave them so much pleasure as well as satisfaction, I think. Um, yeah, to be able to, sorry to so what happens to these kinds of artifacts? These things belong in like museums or historical centers? Hopefully. Um, these happen to be in my possession. Oh. Um, yes, these happen to be in my possession. He did give them to me and um, I am hoping to find a home for them. Um, but, but, you know, they, I found them in other families. <laughs> So, so either he taught other people or others knew how to do this kind of, uh, you know, this kind of crafts work. And um, I, I was just uh, quite amazed, partly because of my own interest in, in uh, crafts and folk art, but that they would be able to produce um, these kinds of, uh -huh. of artifacts. And, and, you know, th these kinds of things are, are uh, quite, um, fragile, you know, as with age, they become quite fragile. So they need to be uh, taken care of very, very carefully. And I'm, I am concerned that families don't realize, you know, the value of these, uh, these kinds of artifacts. I'm hoping that there will be people who will 
uh, recognize them and donate them to museums and so on. Um, but I did want to mention that, that he also um, made his own shakuhachi. Unfortunately, uh, he offered to show it the shakuhachi he made to me. And unfortunately at the time I had to catch a plane. So I couldn't, I couldn't see that. And, and um, the great sadness for me is that um, he got sick after, you know, sometime after I left and, um, and he passed away. So- Shakuhachi is a Jap Japanese bamboo flute. Yes, yes. But apparently they had groups again, of people who, who were interested in the shakuhachi um, made their own and, and played together, as I understand it. I have a photo of him with, with the, the shakuhachi. Uh, so, so um, you know, with all this information that I was collecting, I needed the sort of a narrative glue to tie the stories together in some way. Um, and luckily I found that um, Mr. Kato, I, I wanted to show, share this with you. Mr. Kato, oops, here, um, who was a coffee farmer, had an amazing memory and he kept a detailed journal and then 167 letters home uh, and these were translated by his wife and daughter. So they had this for the family and they shared it with me. And this, you know, was part of that narrative that I was able to, to put together. Um, then Mr. Kawasaki was the, uh, the person, this person here, sorry, timing. Uh, 